Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, uh, and welcome to those of you, too, who are joining virtually. Unfortunately, we couldn't all be here at the, at the same time, um, but we're very pleased today. Today is actually our second uh, annual Carl, Dr. Carl Zorowski uh, lecture here in the department. Uh, and the goal of this lecture is to honor the amazing contributions of Dr. Zorowski and the years of his service to NC State College of Engineering. Uh, and so he uh, and his family helped to endow a Carl Zorowski Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and Dr. Carl Zorowski um, was the late MAE department head uh, and Reynolds Professor Emeritus and was a 60-year veteran of the College of Engineering here at um, NC State. So we thank him and his family for this lecture series. Um, and today, in particularly, we're very pleased that as part of this lecture series, we could bring in Dr. Venkat Provi from Clemson University. So he is the Michelin Endowed Chair in Vehicle Automation. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about exciting advances in, in vehicle automation here. For those of you who don't know, Clemson University has a, their own automotive engineering department and are doing really exciting things, so we'll hear a lot about that. Um, but Dr. Uh, Krovey is an international um, expert in uh, intelligent modulation of distributed physical power interactions uh, for motion and forces between humans and autonomous systems, um, and is working to unlock the power of many. I'm sure he'll talk about to that today and explain to us what he means about that. His research activity focus on the life, sci life cycle treatment, the, which includes design, modeling, analysis, control, implementation, and verification of a new generation of connected autonomy systems for realizing human autonomy of synergy in emerging automotive, plant automation, co-robotics, and defense applications. So there's a lot of exciting things we're going to hear about today. Uh, and of course, he has a large number of awards, positions, very respected in the field. I can't go through all of those today, but he has also taken on significant leadership roles within multiple professional societies, including IEEE, ASME, SAE. Uh, and he has actually also supported the development of the 2020 U.S. Robotics Roadmap, so he's very well known for that. And then finally, he also serves as currently as the editor-in-chief of the ASME Journal of Mechanisms and Robotics. So as I mentioned, there's a lot more awards and historical type thing, but we're all here today to hear what he has to say. So thanks for coming today, and we look forward to the talk. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Thank you all for uh, inviting me here. It's an honor to be uh, presenting at the Dr. Zorowski uh, Memorial Lecture. Um, today's discussion is going to be about, the title, I've changed it slightly from the abstract that you may have seen, but the topical coverage will be largely the same. We're looking at what we're calling connected autonomy systems, um, and we're looking at applications of these in the on-road, off-road, and manufacturing shop floor setting. There are uh, some emerging applications in healthcare that I won't have the time to discuss today. But as Dr. Peters pointed out, there, I, 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 I want to thank her for the kind introduction. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that I have a background in robotics. Um, I did my graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania in 98 was when I graduated. And then since then, uh, had an opportunity to work in a wide variety of areas. So some of these are reflected there, multi-robot cooperation, teleoperation, distributed real-time simulation, and human-robot interaction. But I think the past five years have been a really exciting time in the context of robotics, and I'd like to share with you why. Um, so my own research now builds upon three pillars. There is first and foremost the human in the loop, and I'll explain why this is such a critical element. A lot of people end up focusing on the hardware elements of a robot or the computation simulation pieces of a robot, but I think the least researched area 
is the ability of a human to interact with an autonomous system. And, and I'll look forward to highlighting some of these as we go along. So uh, just one more slide about background. Uh, we've been fortunate in this journey to be part of multiple large-scale endeavors. So in, in the context of the manufacturing space, we've been part of the ARM Robotics Institute. It's a manufacturing USA Institute. I think Dr. Peters was showing us around that NCSU is part of the SESME uh, Institute. Um, and more recently, we became a US uh, DOD Center of Excellence for the Ground Vehicle Systems Center. Um, and we're looking at modeling and simulation efforts. So some of the research that I'm going to talk about it has been conducted in the ambit of these two centers. And last but not least, I think uh, Dr. Peters alluded to this, is that uh, periodically we undertake activities as a community to, uh, it, so this activity is something that we do every four years um, to be able to inform what the future holds in some of this. So some of the material that I'll show you today is uh, abstracted from here, and it, it represents the collective work of the community. So to start this discussion, um, why I'm excited about robotics, and in the, in the broader sense, uh, autonomous systems, is that it, it's been around for a long time. Uh, most people don't realize this. Uh, so uh, in 2010, that's when this picture is from, they celebrated 50 years of robotics. Arguably the first robots were, um, you know, they were clunky, they, they required external power sources and so on, but they, they were operating using the sense, think and act paradigm that people have talked about. Um, so this paradigm, it's not just sense, think, and act, but to do that in real time. And that was the, uh, that was the key aspect of this. It allowed a robot to now do the so-called dull, dumb, dirty, dangerous tasks in the world. And, and the numbers of applications have ever since uh, grown enormously. So over these years, 60 years now, you've had enormous innovations in, in terms of both technology and science. The science part we'll talk about shortly, but I wanted to give the technology piece a little bit of a shout out. So I call this the triple convergence of computing, communication, and miniaturization. And what it allowed that people to do was embed intelligence in situ in what used to be an erstwhile mechanical only system. And there are a number of examples in this world where we can work through that and I have a few to show. But the argument I'm presenting here is that I'd like to misquote Tom Friedman and say that, you know, the robotics world is being flattened or has been flattened. There's not one single point in time when you could claim that this revolution occurred, but if you look at the cumulative effect of this, it these eras as a system science robot and i'm going to use autonomous systems and robotic systems alternately to me they're one and the same and this idea of this being flattened is 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 um, one theme that stands out the other theme that i want you to sort of keep in the back of your mind as i go through the examples is this idea of a digital redesign so uh, as I tell my students, you take something that is fundamentally mechanical and then replace, it might have subsystems, and you replace the physical interconnection with either a bi-wire interconnection or a wireless interconnection. And lo and behold, you have new designs. So just to illustrate this point, let me take a steer-by-wire example. So you're taking a steering column in, a, in an automotive and replacing it with a high fidelity encoder at the steering wheel 
and a high fidelity motor at the drive wheels, at the rack and pinion. At face value, you actually degraded performance of that system because there is an enormous amount of capability of road feel that you get through the steering column. But what you lose in that performance, you now gain in terms of flexibility. And so there are other factors too. So the, the steering column impaling of the driver is the leading cause of death in full frontal crashes. So you gain there too, from a safety perspective. But the flexibility that I'm talking about is this ability to now take that steering wheel, put it anywhere you want in the car. It could be in the back seat. Why? That's a different question. You could, you could say it could be a joystick. It could be multiple steering wheels. Your second steering wheel could be a computer. Your second steering wheel could be in Tokyo. And this ability to mix and match the interface to the human and to additional computing was not possible when you considered the original system that was tightly mechanically coupled, right? So you would say, but it's driving up cost. The argument I would make is, again, through an analogy, and this is not unique to the automotive sector. If you now said, um, when analog cameras became digital, professional photographers swore they would never use it. It did not have the quality. It cost more. But today, you can take a picture, ship it over to Tokyo, my favorite antiportal destination. Right? Have the, somebody touch it up and print it a third city. And this flexibility is what we are starting to see in many other areas. So if you look across consumer electronics, when VCRs became DVRs, when home automation systems now starting to abound, in the automotive. So in the robotics arena, if you start to look, um, how many of you know about the intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot, right? So these examples are, you know, it, it's, it's moving wave after wave as you go through this process. And that, that fundamental capability I tell my students is, it's going to keep us in business for a really long time because it's old lamps for new, uh, using the Aladdin analogy, right? Um, but at the same time, there are some interesting challenges that come up. So we are looking at these so-called smart systems, robotic systems that are mergers of sensing and, com and connectivity. But the place where they are lacking is the ability to work with people and processes. And that is an area that really needs a lot more effort the technology is there, but being able to sort of engineer this so that you're able to take advantage of the robotics paradigm, which is sense, think, and act in real time. So, but then to now connect it to the distributed network paradigm in a meaningful way so that you can engineer capacity back. In, more, in many cases, you have to re-engineer the originally lost capacity, but hopefully that takes a very short time. And then you're moving on to doing more with this. So just to highlight where some of these applications are starting to emerge, traditionally what used to be siloed in either the home vertical or the transport or healthcare or other similar verticals, now you're starting to see a lot more of these compound applications. And these compound applications, a self-driving car on the street some of the technologies that went into it are now going onto the manufacturing shop floor. So BMW is looking at replacing its AGVs with that work with a fixed line with AGVs that roam through the shop floor. And it's using the same SLAM technologies as we'll see later in today's lecture. So this, in this era of cross-pollination, I call this the Cambrian explosion of opportunity being able to now um, 
perform engineer this capacity is is where we see lots of fun lots of opportunities uh, the the underlying principles that are enduring and there are few but being able to use them and mix and match is where the opportunity lies in my opinion so um, very quickly, I'll walk you through some of these different areas that we are going to look at. Um, there are applications that most people consider self-driving cars as the on-road application. But I'd like people to think about some of the emerging applications in two-wheel systems and not on the street, but on the sidewalk. So these are now bicycles inline two-wheel but also uh, Segway-like systems, differential drive two-wheel systems. There's an argument that in 10 years from now, Segways will route themselves to their final destination in New York City. You just have to stand on it, right? Um, these are all emerging applications, and, and I think the idea is that whether or not they will fully fruition um, is, is, is an open question, but at the, the underlying driver, the need, getting the right part to the right place at the right time in a logistics context on the manufacturing shop floor, or uh, getting people to the right place at the right time in a mobility context, these are uh, critical societal needs and will continue to be uh, for a long time to come. And, and the ability to do this flexibly and at low, increasingly reliably and at lower cost is going to be a continuing driver for this. So I'll, I'll give you little exemplars of each one of these as we go along. So the first one, and, and I have a set of three slides that talk about each of the areas that give you sort of, if you took nothing else away from this talk, it just gives you a sense of what we're doing here at Clemson. What you're seeing here is uh, the scale and complexity of connected autonomous systems as we are deploying them now in the on-road context. What you see on the extreme left side is, are the one-tenth scale cars. These are RC cars that have an NVIDIA TK1 or TX1 compute. They have a LiDAR, they have a camera. And what you're seeing is the result of a final project that we're running in our class. So it's a graduate level class entry-level graduate class, seniors are allowed to take it. Um, and what you're seeing in the two videos are that, that, that vehicle running indoors at about you know, five miles an hour, while at the same time in the video on the right, you're seeing that vehicle starting to build what is called a SLAM map, an occupancy grid map of the environment. So the first time it goes around, it builds the map. The next time it goes around, it's using that map to be able to go do things faster. Our students then graduate to a mid-scale system. They use uh, different kinds of golf carts, utility carts, retrofit them with different kinds of sensors. But we also do things at full scale. And so at the full scale system, what you're seeing here is what we are, is the, we have either retrofit existing vehicles or we are also working with full-scale autonomous vehicle that I'll talk more about in the in subsequent set of slides. A quick word about what we are doing in the off-road setting. So the application use cases are, of course, infrastructure, um, but also agriculture. But more recently, we've been fortunate to establish this DOD Center of Excellence. And the DOD is looking for the same things that the commercial auto is looking for. It turns out that 33 major auto companies have set up an autonomy program and literally sucked up all the talent in the marketplace. And so in terms of talent, you're looking for people, in particular, they're looking for people with robotics talent because you're looking, you're looking at people who do systems level work. Um, you might, some might argue uh, that, you know, jack of all trades, a master of none, but the ability to get a system running end to end is a crucial skill that requires years of training. So uh, later on, I can tell you a little bit more about my sentiments about 
Uber purchasing one third of NREC. And when it did that, it was like taking seed crop. Um, the, but this idea of developing talent that now will service this up, upcoming revolution is something that you know we take seriously and I think that's that's the frame in which a lot of this development is occurring. So in in particular in this DOD center what we are seeing is um, we have a case scenario this is one of the robotics and autonomous systems case scenario of a forward reconnaissance bay and you have manned or unmanned uh, vehicle ground vehicle with several drones, either aerial or ground, that are required to now build out a, uh, a map of the area, present this to the human operator, either in situ on the vehicle or at a remote location, and then for the system to work its way to its destination. Things are a little bit harder because the terrain is uncertain. You could be operating under different kinds of lighting conditions. There are no lane markings, but things of that sort. So uh, what we've done is broken this up into several areas, and in particular, one of these, the deep reinforcement learning for cyber physical systems is a topic that I'll talk about using a set of uh, subsequent slides. But again, what you'll see is the from a deployment perspective, when we're doing some of the early science type deployments, we are doing them with smaller scale systems. But our goal is to be able to transition them through the life cycle into full scale systems. And so that is, uh, I think, the unique hallmark of what we've done at Clemson, um, amongst other places, of course, but there's a particular emphasis that we place on it um, for people who are familiar with our Deep Orange program. Um, our students, for example, master's students, build a full scale vehicle every two years during the course of their master's program. Um, and finally, you're starting to see very similar things also on the manufacturing shop floor. So the, some of these are interactions that we had with uh, BMW. Um, so the, on the left side, we're looking at systems that have variable footprint. So in the production process, robots end up being used quite significantly in a whole host of areas, but the assembly process is the final frontier for use of robots. It's very human uh, labor intensive and you need the robots to now work closely with humans in close proximity to humans. So the ability of a vehicle, for example, to shape, change its footprint to run through narrow spaces is one such capability. What you're seeing in the video below is uh, a new architecture for what we call a mobile lift assist. So the lift, uh, Traditionally, lift assists are grounded. They create fixed points in a manufacturing production line. But being able to replace that with this mobile lift assist, which is a omnidirectional base with a tripod on it, allows you to take 20, 30 pound payloads. And now the two modes of operation, a visual surveying mode where it tracks you as you're walking down. So we had it trained on a BMW logo. Uh, so the associate walks on the floor and it now follows you around like a mule. Um, or the alternate one is with a feather touch, you can now raise it to bring it up to uh, the assembly level. So again, overhead assembly, for example, is one of the most challenging types of assembly tasks. And we can talk more about it. Today's talk is not about manufacturing per se. But we're seeing that the same types of uh, technologies can become relevant there. We do uh, different kinds of gesture interfaces at mid-scale mid, mid level, but also at the full-scale level. We're looking at what you're seeing on the right, extreme right video is the um, ARM Institute project that we call the Smart Companion Project. It, using LiDAR-based SLAM and other uh, situational awareness, it automatically picks up reasonably heavy parts, in this case it's a torsion bar, and prefetches it to a final destination where it's holding it for an associate to now come and do the final assembly. So in that, it's like an apprentice doing the job, but it's, it's now 
doing it independent of human labor. And again, the overhead assembly task is, is one of the, as I said, uh, ergonomically very challenging tasks. So I wanted to give you this high level overview of on-road, off-road, and the manufacturing shop floor. And now we'll start to talk about what it takes to make that possible, at least at our place. So when I came in there, um, I joined there in 2016. And so it was very much build up capability and bring together multiple faculty, um, some, some new faculty whom we hired, but there were others. Uh, so courses in automotive electronics, autonomous perception and autonomous driving coupled with the autonomy science and systems course that I talked about, coupled with a lot of main campus courses went into helping our students sort of get, into, get to a point uh, where they're able to deploy these systems. Um, so in what I'm going to show you next, we are going to focus on the on-road setting. And in terms of scale, as I highlighted, we're looking at smaller scale systems when we're doing some of the basic science type research. But the frameworks that we end up using, the middleware frameworks, ROS, MathWorks, um, the NVIDIA tool chain, and so on, allow us to transition it through the TRL levels to reach uh, full-scale deployments relatively easily. And, and so I can stand here and say relatively easily. It's the students who do the work and who make the magic possible. So maybe you need to check in with them. Um, so the first set of vignettes, research vignettes I'm showing you uh, are focused on what I call the deep reinforcement learning approaches for cyber physical systems. Um, I think of a cyber physical, a modern day cyber physical system as a merger of an underlying electromechanical layer um, coupled with a sensing and actuation layer, coupled with a size, weight, and power constrained computation layer, coupled with an algorithmic layer. And these are now multiple sets of layers that stack on top of each other and any end-to-end -end implementation often is a design selection of one set of options between within each layer all the way to the bottom. The flexibility now comes in our ability to switch to alternate options within a layer. A different SLAM algorithm, a different control algorithm if you wish or being able to use different computation opportunities to distribute the computation. So in that sense, um, traditionally, this is not new, right? But as cyber physical systems have grown, you start to create more and more of these opportunities. And finding those designers, those experts who know how to do this is proving to be increasingly challenging. So in some sense, uh, in, in these cases, these are all multifunction systems. They depend upon component level realization of autonomy, subsystem level realization of autonomy, system level realization. And the number of closed loops that you have there create some of the, in, those interconnections create the challenges. And so being able to have a computational assist for this is where the opportunity lies. And people have been doing it. They've been using design and uh, simulation to do this in an offline setting. But the transition of this into an online real-time setting is where the opportunity comes. And as I'll motivate uh, in what we're doing. So in this particular case, AI-based frameworks now create this opportunity to do this in real time. So I call it, you know, both the offline design selection and the online dynamic orchestration of these uh, parameters, settings, and behaviors. So in this one slide, I wanted to give a shout out to one of my colleagues who's doing this work. Uh, let's consider the case where I have a vehicle that is now equipped with some LIDAR or a rangefinder that's able to see the terrain just in front of me. And using which, I'm able to update the parameters of the suspension. 
So everybody here, I hope, recognizes that adaptive suspensions are here in commercial vehicles. But being able to usually, by the time you drive over a bumpy road and the vehicle uses accelerometers mounted on the axle to recognize that the road is bumpy and then starts to adjust the suspension to it, you've already lost time. But what if you could use a rangefinder to look 10 feet ahead, a LiDAR rangefinder to look 10 feet ahead, using which you're able to then adjust your suspension. So you're almost bracing for what is to come. And so in this case, right, uh, whether it's now in the context of shock regulation, terrain estimation, or smart suspensions, you can break it up into a number of these technical problems. But the, un the, the core premise is I want to enhance performance of my system to better handle uncertainty in the world. And I want to do this in real time while I'm driving 60 miles an hour or faster. And so uh, the ability to now cast this, so people have been looking at problems like these in control systems, uh, adaptive control, system identification and adaptive control for quite a while. We have Chris here who's been doing some of these interesting things in the past. But this idea of being able to do this with a deep learning network uh, is where the real time aspects start to come to the light. So in particular, I'm working with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Umesh Vaidya, who is focused on something called deep Koopman learning. And what it is is that your, your traditional vehicle and its state, its dynamical system, state space is highly nonlinear. But there is an opportunity to use functions that transform that state space into a linear state space. You, the pros, only one small problem. You have to find these functions, and there are ways you can construct them for special classes. But in most cases, that nonlinear to linear transformation ends up being quite a challenge. But once you are in that lifted linear space, you can do quite a lot of things. You can bring the entire power of linear system theory to bear on the problem. This is 60 plus years or even longer. You can, you can design your system in that lifted space and then bring it back to the original space. So that's the concept. All of this now depends upon finding these so-called nonlinear to linear lifting functions. And, and we'll talk about that. So that's one class of problems I'll talk about. And then additionally, in the, in the community, uh, there are a lot of efforts right now to do what are called end-to-end -end learning. Um, or this is now both in the context of imitation learning as well as reinforcement learning. And so I'll, talk, I'll give you a little vignettes of each and we can follow up uh, if people have an interest in the specific uh, mathematics of it. So starting out with kind of on the easier front, uh, what we are looking at at first is on the left is the imitation learning context, which is it's a form of supervised learning where you collect ahead of time um, sets of data that are correlated. So in the example that we'll show you, it is the video feed coming in from the camera coupled with the steering angle and optionally even the accelerometer profile. Using these two synchronized data streams, you can now essentially do a fitting, this, the supervised learning that we are talking about is nothing more than, well, it is more, but it, it is, you can think of it as a form of fitting of the data to create, uh, to create a model. Because once you have that model, in all future instances, you can use that in an inferencing mode so that if you then feed in the video feed, it would tell you what is the corresponding steering angle. So that's the core premise behind that. The other one that we'll talk about is the reinforcement learning, and I think I have a separate slide for that. So we'll show you both of these. 
But to deploy these, what we are doing this is in, in the context of scaled vehicles. And so the scaled vehicle here is a one-tenth scale car that I talked about earlier that actually has a, it's, it's a remarkable opportunity for people who are looking at mechatronic systems, for example, to help to redesign this. We've created an instance of this. This was with colleagues of mine at University of Pennsylvania, Rahul Mangaram. Um, and we've created a couple of generations of this. The entire bill of materials is online at f110th.org. You can, you can then, um, we've actually created a curriculum uh, that was initially just in the, on the website. We call it Build, Learn, and Race. So in the learn part, people work through the curriculum. And then finally, in the race part, we hold annual international con competitions, typically associated with our conferences, where students come together and start racing these. In, in the early cases, it was just single vehicle racing. Now we have head-to-head -head racing. And it's exciting. I think students get naturally engaged in this sort of thing. We were fortunate that we were able to take this to the NSF and to the CCRI program and tell them how we're helping to build this community. And, and they gave us a little bit of funding to be able to do this. But, you know, these are, this is not the only platform that you want to you can deploy on. There are a number of commercial products that are available. And I, I just wanted to sort of show you what, what's out there in that context. But in this setting, then, if you're looking at the imitation learning setting, the goals then, the process, the workflow then becomes, first, I'd like to be able to gather the data. So I have a steering wheel angle in this case that is now synchronized with my video feed. So that video feed data with the steering angle gets shipped off into this deep learning network where it's doing supervised learning. It's labeled data. The labeling is your steering angle. Um, and it's learning that correlation through, through this network. And after that learning process is done, from now on, whenever you present it with a set of that video, it extracts out the corresponding steering angle. So this is now the inferencing stage of this. So it is a phenomenal system that requires no physics knowledge, no awareness of the system. It's purely input data to output data, and you're using a correlation, if you wish. And it works phenomenally, except when it doesn't. So uh, NVIDIA sort of unveiled this originally at CES. And they had ended up training the system at typically in the early mornings. And then they had to deploy this at a mid-afternoon session. And uh, of course, there was epic fail. But the idea is powerful in that you do not need to model every aspect of the system end to end. And so one of the things that we are starting to see here is like our students, right, go through this process now. And they said, OK, we are going to recreate the NVIDIA thing. So they started testing within the lab. Then they started to take it out into to doing lane keeping in an unknown environment. All this was during the pandemic when there were no people or traffic around our campus. They were driving around in the middle of the street and at night. Uh, and then, so the piece de resistance is they created, a, recreated the Melbourne track in a parking lot outside our lab, outside our building. And so this is now the vehicle autonomously navigating that under different, uh, after being trained on it for a while. And then you'll see somebody, one of the students actually go and changes some of these ob obstacle positions. And it is still able to work its way around, except when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so our claim is we've ended up recreating the NVIDIA epic fail, but not quite. 
the other context that you have here is now reinforcement learning uh, where rather in, in the first context you had to collect a lot of data and it had to be labeled data, right? So here in this context what you're doing is you're taking an environment and this environment could be the real environment with a real system or it could be a simulation environment. You input to it actions and you extract from it the states and you use it to calculate a reward. And so you're using this reward function together with uh, the actions and the states to train a deep learning network. So this is also, uh, you could call it supervised learning in the sense that the simulation or the physical system is now doing the supervision, right? Except that this is now much more amenable to being deployed in a, in a, in a real-time setting. Um, so this idea here is that you could start off with no knowledge of the environment or limited knowledge of the environment and use it to now refine what you're learning about the environment as you're going along. Um, for people who are familiar with optimization, people say, oh, this is just optimization. And arguably, uh, there are many parallels between traditional optimization and this deep learning, uh, reinforcement learning uh, deployment that we can talk about. I don't want to do this on a live camera. So again, what our students have been doing is that they are looking at, so one of the big challenges here, again, in this context is um, when you do this with a real life system, there is something called negative consequences. So you, you basically input into the system a set of actions and you look to see what happens. Some of these actions might actually cause you to run into a wall, negative consequences. And so you want to avoid that and thereby simulation ends up proving to be a good surrogate for doing these. But simulation environments don't typically have the fidelity that you would need in order to re work in real life. And so this ability to mix and match simulation and the real world is something that people talk about all the time. So there is a concept called real to sim, conversion of the real world into a simulation training in that simulation environment, uh, and then being able to put it back into the real world. So what our students have been doing is that they start out with trying to do real to sim. So they use a vehicle, drive it around an environment, use the LiDAR data to then create a scan of the, of the environment that they're going to operate in. Within that, they set up the problem in a reinforcement learning context. And there are a number of tools that are available. In this case, they're using the MATLAB uh, reinforcement learning toolbox and the pipeline. And after training, you're able to push it back into that environment. So the context is that you can work yourself, even if you're given a completely unknown environment, you can get a very similitude of it within your uh, simulation system, train exceedingly hard in the simulation context where you don't have to worry about consequences, and then transition it back for the final deployment into your. So again, um, what you, so the types of things these students do in the context of racing are you have existing tracks, and then you first, of course, train on a known track make sure that you're able to get the race line and optimize it very well, but then start to make changes to the track to see how robust this deployment is. Um, and so uh, if additional obstacles show up on your track, if initially you know, the racing context now provides a sense of coming first, quick, quick finishes and so on. And so are there ways in which you can improve your your throttling and your steering to be able to get to the finish faster. That's, those are the types of opportunities that you have uh, in this context. So again, I'll, 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 I'm just highlighting what you're doing, but we're using very similar types of things now also for our DOD context where as you're traversing une uneven terrain, let's imagine that you now have some range finding 
can I now change my vehicle suspension? That was one. But the other thing is like, can I use an in interesting combination of braking and uh, acceleration to be able to ride my bumps through? So there are, there are opportunities like that to do sensor-based intelligent control. Now a quick word about the Deep Koopman reinforcement learning approach. In this case, as I said, the goal is to be able to convert the nonlinear space into a linear, into a linearized space where you can then start to use the linear models. Um, and, and, and the challenge, as I said, is not just being able to do it in an abstract setting, but to be able to now deploy it on vehicles. So in that sense, the real-time aspects drive a need. So you could, you could think of boutique lifting functions that you develop by hand for very specialized cases. But for production level uh, deployments, what you might want is that use the neural network's capability as a universal function approximator to be able to develop those uh, functions. So whether you're using it in um, online system ID and adaptive control setting, so that you might, in terms of a traditional uh, autonomous vehicle deployment uh, pipeline, you have four big areas. You have the perception pipeline, you have the simultaneous localization and mapping pipeline, um, you have the uh, symbolic planning and execution, and finally the metric planning and execution. So the opportunities for including this could be in the final step, or you could go earlier in the cycle and make it an integral part of the perception pipeline. And so we're, we're attempting to do both. So in particular, using uh, an encoder-decoder capability in the DNN, uh, you are approximating the lifted n-dimensional representation from just raw data. And in particular, the value in this comes in that you don't need to know what is the raw data that will ultimately be part of the lift, lifted space. And so that there are some, there's some, this is a black box approach in that sense, but having developed that lifted function, you can still, you can use it in an inverse setting to be able to now smoothly transition between the linear space and nonlinear space. So how well does it do? And so here is the part where um, this has now been used for setting up a trajectory tracking of this system. And so your, your, your linear space system is now called the lifted dynamical system. And in that, for that lifted dynamical system, setting up things like model predictive control now become almost trivial. And so this was then tested in the context of a simulation environment with different racetracks to do race line optimization. And then finally, um, the actual deployment becomes relatively easy using these simple systems. So what you're seeing here is the, uh, you know, straight hallways become relatively useful. Dr. Peters and I were talking about the benefits or disadvantages of straight hallways. Um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll now transition to the full-scale systems that we are working with. I realize I'm running out of time. So one of the things that we are pursuing at Clemson is, uh, the reason I call it connected autonomy is, I believe that the vehicle of the future will now require both connectivity and autonomy. And so in that context, there are already deployments of this that happen with, within the vehicle where you have the benefit of a CAN bus that connects, interconnects all these components. Some of the security challenges and bandwidth limitations, et cetera, are now making a transition to, let's say, automotive ethernet. But ultimately, um, you're, you're looking at some sort of wired connection. What if you could now start to make it wireless? In particular, as you're starting to put in different kinds of sensors on the vehicle, 
a typical LiDAR suite ends up giving you 0.1 terabytes an hour. And so being able to handle all of this has suddenly become a big data problem. And so the opportunity exists in that what it does is it gives you digital insight into the vehicle. And maybe it's immediate environment. The question is, do you need it? They say data is gold, but is it? So these are the questions that we kind of grapple with. And as we are doing this, uh, we're working with, you know, there are multiple people across campus who are working in this area. And so what we've done is that we are looking at it in the context of what would a V cycle, ISO 26262 deployment of something like this look like to a manufacturer? And in terms of how they could now ultimately, they might start out with test preparation, scenario sources that come from regulatory, real world, other cases, but then by the time you work yourself through the case, through these, even with the traditional uh, vehicle model, what you are start, starting to see is that the verification and validation was proving incredibly challenging simply because of all the dependencies. So on the bottom slide here, bottom of the slide here, what you're seeing is a modern day car has 100 million lines of code already. That's more code than an F-22, Boeing 787 combined. And trying to get people and, and processes aware of the complexity versus and, and get their competence in this area has proven to be, I think, a challenge. And so in that setting, you know, at least we are aware of what is going to be needed in order to fully deploy these systems into the future. Our attempt at making a dent in this is what we've created something that we call an open CAV framework. So we realize that hardware in the loop testing and simulation are two sides of this coin and we need to do both. But as I said, it becomes an enterprise scale data management problem for better or for worse, but it also creates an opportunity for our students in that they are getting themselves familiar with the tools. So we run a professional master's program at our place at ICAR, and our students who become familiar with these tool chains can in fact go and make an impact in industry. So whether it's now developing for people who've been to ICAR previously, this is our building outside, outside our building, and we're able to do the digital twin of the vehicle and the actual testing of the vehicle and being able to bring them as close as possible is where the opportunity lies. So in the remaining five minutes or so, I'll try to run through what we are doing here. So the way I would like you to think about this is on, on the left side of your picture is now the virtual world, the simulated world. And on the right side of the picture is all the real world. And we have the ability to use the digital twin and the physical twin um, joined at the hip, so to speak, uh, in performing a lot of these. So from an infrastructure perspective, we have a Ross AutoWare enabled vehicle. It's a Chrysler Pacifica hybrid that has the AutoWare suite of sensors that now runs Ross uh, and AutoWare. Uh, at, and so our students are able to take this and do testing at, at full scale, as you'll see in a second. And on the simulation front, we now have the ability to dabble with a number of simulator outputs. So we see, um, you know, there's, there's pre-scan, there is Metamoto, there is Vires VTD, and I have some further examples. So on the simulation front, um, let me see if I can play this. Researchers at Clemson University's OpenCAV group are creating a novel modular, open architecture, open interface, and open source software-based research instrument for software-in-the-loop and hardware-in-the-loop design, validation, and verification. 
Clemson partnered with Metamoto because their robust enterprise architecture gave them the scale they required. The use of virtual GPUs promised to lower the cost of hardware by reducing the number of GPUs while ensuring that the same level of service was still available. Testing and validating autonomous system software in the real world is important. However, the sheer volume of testing required to make safe autonomous system software requires simulation. There are many variables, including weather conditions, time of day, traffic conditions, and pedestrian behavior. To test all possible permutations of these, even in simulation, requires substantial compute resources. There is a challenge of GPU utilization in high-performance computing. Some jobs rarely use the requested GPU resources, and some jobs only utilize a fraction of GPU capacity. Maximizing GPU utilization has a real impact on HPC operation, and NVIDIA virtualization... So I'll, I'll pause it there. That's a YouTube video. So it turned out that what we were doing caught the attention of NVIDIA, and they, sh they decided to uh, showcase us at GTC. And that was the video that they helped us produce for that. So I wish my students could do such videos routinely. Um, but in essence, what we were doing is taking the simulation environment and coupling to it through a variety of API interfaces, whether it's Python, ROS, or ROS MATLAB. And, and this then, in each of these cases, um, lets you do something called system under test. So you can you can take that, that, that system, you can simulate the rest of the system, and your software is now the piece that you're now testing. So in this case, as, as we were looking to do ADAS system testing, uh, we wanted to check what should be the parameters for an ADAS system that, that does a, a break, automatic emergency braking. And so whether it's now with a fixed vehicle or with a pedestrian, um, this is now right outside our building, as I said earlier. Um, you, can, you can start to now do iterations of this. And these, what you're seeing here is now the individual cases, but you can start to do scenario testing at scale. So in this context, under a wide variety of lighting conditions time of day, weather. So arguably, people claim 100 million miles worth of testing is required to get an autonomous vehicle to the same level of fidelity as a physical vehicle, as, as current commercial vehicles. And so we hope that you know this proficiency in simulation will help to shorten some of, and coupled with some of the uh, deployments will help to shorten and all of this is being done by automotive engineers. It's not computer scientists. So these are traditionally mechanical engineers who then, um, you know, I think a former department chair of mine said, mechanical engineering um, is the liberal arts of the 21st century. And I, I think I stand by that. Um, so again, you know, you could start to evaluate all of this. Uh, one approach versus another, and the details are there in the paper that I talked about, but I think you've got the gist of what I talked about. We're also doing things like hardware in the loop simulation uh, setup, where, where you, traditionally you might, take, you might take a force feedback driving wheel connected to different kinds of simulators, a micro auto box in this case, and a Scalexio, to be able to uh, D display different kinds of uh, assist functions. But in, in addition to this, what we did was to replace the direct connection of this through a network simulator. So what a network simulator lets you do is put in, dial in, essentially network latency effects, network imperfections. So uh, band-limited lossy networks can be simulated in this based on a distribution. And so you can then start to look at what it takes to do remote teleoperation of these systems. So in this case, what you're seeing is you're, 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 you're now time delayed in terms of uh, what your steering action is as received by the system. And so how would you stabilize and how would you passivate such a system now becomes an interesting, challenging problem. Um, 
So again, uh, different variants in this case, only steering wheel, in this case, steering wheel plus the force feedback. And what you're, and, 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 and so a lot of these are projects that we work with our master students to help them get the proficiency, but with a PhD student attached, because they're helping to develop the framework that the PhD student then uses for writing the papers, et cetera. So it's been work in progress, but it's starting to fruition in terms of uh, deployments. And last but not least is, is the actual vehicle testing. So we have the teleoperation of that vehicle. So you can see the driver sitting and using the joystick in his hand to drive the vehicle. And the full-scale deploy of the systems now within an autoware context. So it, at least at this point, what they can do is waypoint following. So the, you take the vehicle, drive it around in the environment. The first time you drive it around, it uses its laser scans and then creates a map of the environment. And then from in the future uh, deploys of that, it now uses something called adaptive Monte Carlo localization to locate itself within that map and then start to do waypoint following um, at full scale. So I know I went a tiny bit over, but I wanted to pause here and take questions. All right, so we have time for a few questions from the audience. Chris? I have a, a couple questions. Thank you. First, first of all, it's a very nice talk, um, and I'm glad you were able to, to come to campus and share your work with us. Um, so. Uh, I guess um, the first one, which is maybe a little bit of a philosophical question, is um, when you talk about the, I think you called it the sim to real environment, uh, whereby you uh, train your simulation environment using experiments and then train the, the deep learning very hard using the simulation environment. Um, you know, presumably, the, the idea of that is when you're actually conducting experiments in the field, as you said, you don't want to be uh, trying maneuvers that are going to crash you into a wall or into another car. Now, the, the question is, but when you're running the simulation environment, when you're training your system in the simulation environment, you absolutely want to be trying that. So um, how do you ensure sufficient richness of data in your experiments to do this kind of system ID that you need to do to be able to extrapolate to those situations that are going to be dangerous without actually putting yourself in harm's way? So... Fantastic question. If you know the answer to this, uh, I would give you a million bucks. But I think I think that is that is the that is the, that is the no no thank you. But but thank you for giving. I didn't have the opportunity to really work through all the the concept is very uh, how do you call it interesting, right? You run around in in an environment once, quickly create a model of it in your simulation environment train in that environment, and lots of AI gyms have, these are called AI gyms, by the way, have sprung up, and then be able to ultimately deploy back in the real world. And I think the, the ability to model using uh, only a data-based approach, so you have no human in that process sitting and constructing. So there are a number of options there. One is, if you knew the environment that you were going to be operating in, you could pay somebody to create a model of that environment to be as rich and capable as the actual physical world. It still wouldn't account for dynamic obstacles and things that change over time. But, you know, so the auto industry is already doing this with HDL maps. So your, your Garmin's and other GPS providers now are coming up with maps of the world that they're paying somebody to go drive through with uh, like a with different range finders, laser range finders, and create these detailed maps. And the idea is that it is, it'll be training in that virtual world will be close enough for the vehicle to adjust to the small differences that will emerge in the physical world. But we know that in the construction, in, in highway world, 
construction is the norm rather than the exception, right? The idea that, you know, you have a map of the world uh, is, I think, an oversimplification. It might work on a, on a factory shop floor where you can control that area a lot better, which is actually one of the reasons why I like the factory shop floor in this setting, because I call it a microcosm of a smart city. But to your point, the ability to take these sensor data, and not just LiDAR, but LiDAR camera, multi-sensor uh, data, fuse it to create a better map of the environment uh, is the holy grail, right? And, and how much is enough, whether Chris Vermillion's multi-sensor fusion method is going to do it or not, is that those are the types of opportunities, research opportunities that this thing creates. So at our level, right, what we're doing is looking at systems and, and what, how could such a system be set up? And, and then uh, I think we see... Uh, We've created a lot of problems for ourselves. That would be my short answer. <laughs> I think I think it's a challenging question. I was just uh, curious your perspective. Yeah, my only uh, my only other question, which is a quick one, is uh, in terms of your your Koopman deep learning uh, uh, methodology and stuff. I was really really interesting. The first thing that came to mind when I thought about that is, um, do you know about the the work that Francesco Borelli is doing over at Berkeley in uh, learning MCC? And I was just wondering yes. if you've done uh, any benchmarking. Uh, because he's doing autonomous racing as well. Yes. So um, the thing that I had intended to do, um, let me just actually, I don't know how this thing got here. Uh, the thing that I had intended to do was also put up some slides about a workshop that we've been setting up. So the workshop is on autonomous racing. We did one last year at ICRA. That was very well received. We actually had uh, Ugo Rosalia come oh, yeah, talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, I met with him when I was up. Yeah. Uh, um, this year again, we're doing the second autonomous racing workshop. Uh, ICRA is going to be in Philly. So if you get a chance, please show. Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but we've got, I, I can share the links of this with you, but we've got a fantastic set of speakers uh, who are doing this autonomous racing at full scale and at this scale. And I think in many cases, I think we see that it is going to take significant community-focused community effort to get to that scale, uh, to get to even make a dent into this. So uh, Borelli's group is doing fantastic work. There are some groups from Germany. We had Chris Gerdes come give the talk last time about is racing, autonomous racing for Pike Peak. So we're trying to make this as uh, invigorating a workshop as possible, just simply to get the computer science world to start talking to the mechanical engineering world. And, and, and that is where, see the questions that you asked are also the, like how much resolution of the environment do I want to have as a representation in, in my digital world? for me to be able to train effectively? That is a fundamental modeling question. Okay. Well, you're on my schedule today, so we can chat. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. How long will it be before we see a safe and reliable autonomous vehicle? <sighs> I, think, I, I think you see several of these already. Uh, my, and I, I say that tongue in cheek, because if you take a tram at Orlando, any one of the theme parks in Orlando, it is an autonomous vehicle. It's operating in a highly structured environment. And the more you can control that environment, the easier the autonomy is. It is in this ability to loosen, to operate in less structured environments that the, you're starting to see the problems. And, and, and on, on road, for example, um, Tesla currently deploys full-scale autonomy, but only in highways through their autopilot. And even that, you can, you can have some challenges. So there is a concept called ODDs, uh, Operational Design Domains, 
that help define what, what are the circumstances in which you can deploy these. Um, and highways are going to be first, communities, um, like there's several old age communities in Florida that have signed up to be the first for testing. Because it's this ability that if it is successful, or even during the process, the ability to restore mobility to people who cannot drive is a powerful enabler. Um, so the rollout is going to be slow. Um, if you're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, um, I think autonomous vehicles have gone through the peak of inflated expectations. Then after that, there is the trough of uh, disillusionment. And then there is the so-called slope of enlightenment. And I fervently believe we're starting to come out of the trough onto the slope of enlightenment. Um, so it, when I took this job at Clemson, I figured it'll keep me busy for the at least next 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And after that, who knows? That seems like a good vision to leave on. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. We have a uh, thank you gift from the department and a uh, certificate here as a thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for being here. Catch up with you later. I maybe I'll catch up with you later today, but yeah. I realize you have to probably busy Friday ahead of you. We have this um, the graduate for that's right, board that is visiting. Yeah. I think uh Srinath had mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Some of the main thing is true. I think we can dial this up. Take me while I also yeah. wanted you to know for, that you've hired a long time. Who knows where I'm from? Fantastic. Not a tour. I don't know that we have to feel about the condiment drinks. That was his own. So, so the one thing that we talk about here as we talk about Harvey and the supervised learning is that. What if you could take the essence of the reason why you capture in a module of behavior and then play it back? I have this to say about racing because I did it too for four years. It is a much more controlled situation than driving on the road. I would much rather this in drive on the highway. I mean, the state has a better Everybody knows what they're doing, and I think the mosquitoes like they just go higher, and you're on a road road with the highway. So it's safety precautions and everything. People think they're Well, I think and you wouldn't oh, come yeah. around. Yeah. 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 Next week, it was just um, more yeah. easy yeah. to But it's a, it's a very. Um, I find it a much more easy to
It's a, it's an operation in the wine domain.